This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. This is Stuart Rogers of Venture Beat. Thank you, Stuart. This is Sandra Ponce de Leon, and thank you so much for joining us on this inaugural episode of Popping the Bubble, and we spell that with an invisible E at the end. And we're here in the lovely offices of Venture Beat. Thank you for hosting us here in downtown San Francisco. Yeah, absolute pleasure. It's uh, it's a really beautiful day as well. I mean, I hate to to date your content by saying how awesome it is outside. No, uh, let's date it though, because we, it's pretty special. Because Bernie Sanders. Oh, by the way, this is Pete from Popping the Bubble <laughs> with the with the invisible and silent. So thank you, Stuart. You are the director of marketing technology for Venture Beat. So what exactly does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a multi part role. And that's because, you know, the only time I like sitting twiddling my thumbs is when I've got a PlayStation controller in my hands, right? So I like to fill up my day with multiple roles. You know, some of the time I, I write news for VentureBeat News. Uh, so some of the time I'm a journalist. Some of the time I'm an analyst for VB Insight, which is our research arm. And, uh, that means just basically digging down and, and working through data and working out what's really happening in the world. Uh, and writing reports around that and producing content around that. And I get to uh, to manage the VB Insight team. And uh, some of the time, people ask me to come and stand on stage and uh, tell bad jokes in a British accent. You know, I get to do that around the data, because goodness only knows when you uh, start talking to people about data and research and analysis, it's usually sort of instant narcolepsy and everyone just falls asleep. So you've got to jazz it up a bit and tell a few jokes. How do you jazz that up? Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult, but at the same time, what we're talking about here really is not the story of the numbers. It's not the story of the words. It's the story of how do we actually sell and market products in the 21st century to an audience that has got a smartphone within three feet of them throughout the entire day. Uh, people who wake up and on average, grab their smartphone within the first 25 seconds and start looking at social media. How do you reach that audience? How do you sell products these days? And actually, when you're talking to an audience full of business owners and marketers and developers who want to get their product seen, uh, that becomes kind of interesting to them. Throwing in a cat picture and a Donald Trump joke occasionally just, you know, helps to keep it fresh. That's right. We love cats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This, you know, this show is really about demystifying the tech bubble for the masses or technology for the masses. So it's great to have you as part of the ecosystem because journalism and writing about technology is such a huge part and such a huge necessity for startups. So it's uh, great to have you as our first guest. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. If, we, if you wouldn't mind just getting to know you a little bit better, I know you have quite a unique relationship with Prince. We are all still in mourning over that loss. Uh, you have a Prince story? I have a Prince story, yeah. Whoa. Well, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's now, quite now the in. Prince I'm story. In. It's quite the I'm Prince story. <laughs> well, I, I was I was one of those annoying kids that uh, got into computers really, really young, and I had actually had my first two independent games published when I was twelve. Um, back in the day, that meant basically they were printed out in Sinclair User Magazine, and you had to write them in because the, that was the, how we distributed games back then. These are video games, yeah, that games. got Basics? printed on paper. Uh, they were written <laughs> in machine code for a ZX eighty one, okay. actually, uh, to fit them in the memory. Um, and at the same time, I was playing lots of different instruments as well and doing music and, and writing and recording my own stuff. And the two of those eventually uh, came together. So I w eventually gave up playing instruments and sampled them instead and started sequencing computer computerized sampled music. So those two came together. But at the time, I was kind of um, – I wanted to find out who else was doing their own music, who else was writing and recording their own stuff so I could learn from them. And uh, I went into my record store and – said, you know, who's doing this stuff? And uh, they probably shouldn't have let a 12-year-old walk out with a copy of Dirty Mind by Prince, but they did. <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually understand what the lyrics to Head meant anyway at 12, so <laughs> I was really focused on the music. You know, I went away and I listened to it, and it was the best thing I'd heard. That started off this just obsession with, with Prince, uh, which then ultimately led to me getting involved with the uh, fan groups and... There was a big trip planned to go to Minneapolis. Pretty much bankrupted me at the time because I was only a kid. But I found the money and I went to Minneapolis. And we were sat watching the Staples Singers in the Fine Line Cafe in Minneapolis. 
somebody came up to us on this table, big round table, and said, you know, would you mind moving uh, around to just one side of the table? We've got somebody that wants to, to join the other side of the table. By the way, when they join, please don't uh, make eye contact or anything. Just, you know, let them get on with it. It's a special guest. And we're like, special guest, don't make eye contact. We think we know what's going on. Right. Hulk Hogan's going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he arrived and Prince sat at our table and he was four feet away. And I will never forget, actually, the most memorable thing about him was not how tall he was or how impeccably dressed he was or, you know, just how amazing he looked. It was, it was the smell, the, you know, the, the cologne. It was nothing that I'd ever smelled before. Wow. Which has always stayed with me. I mean, they say like olfactory sense is actually sure. really important, but, uh, it was incredibly important. He stayed there for a few songs. I couldn't help but glance and make eye contact and break the rules and, uh, and then he went away. I then spent even more money that I didn't have <laughs> on a, on a leather jacket that was actually designed by and customized by his clothes designers at Paisley Park. Wow. I took that back to the UK with me after negotiating my first overdraft with the bank over telephone because uh, I couldn't <laughs> check out at the hotel. And I'd how have, old were you at this time? Uh, that would have been, um, I, I guess I would have been uh, ooh, 20, 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 20. I went back. Uh, I went to another Prince convention. My future wife saw the jacket and made an absolute beeline for me. You know, that's what brought us together. So, you know, my wife... And I've been brought together by Prince. And then it, that wasn't even the end of the story. We just, we got involved with uh, knowing the band and meeting up with them when they were over. And, you know, it wasn't the last time I actually met him. You know, we, we stayed really on the inner circle of what it meant to be around the sort of Prince community for forever. And it's been really tough and it's been, you know, really difficult because we've been so involved with it and got to know so many great people through Prince. You know, we'll always be thankful for the fact that he effectively brought us together in the first place. Amazing. Amazing. Did he smell the same when the every time you saw him? Same scent? Pretty pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And he smells of flowers or he smelled of flowers. Wow. So yeah, it was a unique thing. I have never never sort of nobody's ever sort of replicated that scent with a cologne or, you know, anything else. How did Prince captivate you? What was it about him? It was originally the music, but you know, then as you saw performance after performance after performance, mm -hmm. you know just had such an incredible stage presence and charisma and you know taught me a, a lot in that sense in terms of you know showmanship and craftsmanship and you know, we were very lucky because we got the the nod on where he was going to be after the concert right so mm -hmm. we'd go to the concert but then we'd be some of the few people that were told where the after show was going to be and then he'd turn up at three o'clock in the morning and we'd have our own extra concert in these small wow. locations wow. you know beyond the big sort of Wembley Arena or beyond, you know, wherever we were in the world watching him, it'd always be some sort of after show that only a few people knew about. And that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm so jealous. Yeah. That is really amazing. He's so hard to get to. Yeah, it was, it was outstanding. And it's, you know, it's been a, a massive part of our life in that respect. What music from Prince, how, how do you rank his stuff? Are you being on Purple Rain or what albums really stood out to you? That's really tough. You can't ask, uh, you can't ask me to, to, to rank any of the albums. Well, you don't have to rank it, but just what comes to yeah. mind? What moves you sonic? Cause there's different eras. There's. Yeah. Actually, probably a lot of the stuff that you guys have never heard, if I'm honest, because, you know, the albums that, that came out, every single one of them has its own place in history and they, they, they all have something to offer. Some of them, you know, a little bit less than others. You know, there's a couple of songs on, uh, you know, some of the later albums that I just don't really care for that much. But actually, a lot of the stuff that I'm really, really into is some of the unreleased tracks that uh, most people would not have actually got access to or ever heard. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about what they call the vault, where he's, you know, there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of tracks. But there was a time when those were sort of being leaked or released. And then, you know, the fans were putting those together and we'd all share cassettes, you know, back in the day when uh, uh, piracy used to mean to tape recorders yeah, and pressing yeah. uh pressing record and play at the same time right, right. famous mixtapes um <laughs> you know and we that's how we would pass the the unreleased stuff around and there were some incredible songs on a lot of the unreleased track at one time they did release a big four disc series called crystal ball which had a lot of the unreleased stuff on at 
really high quality. You know, if you get access to a copy of the, the four disc crystal ball set, you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. Some really amazing stuff on there. Segwaying back into technology, how did you actually land where you are? How did you get into a career in journalism? Well, going back to the video games, I went straight from school into selling home computers. And that was fine. It was like Commodore 64s and, you know, Amiga 500s and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I always popped my head around the corner to the other side of the business and saw what they were doing in business computers mm -hmm. and actually thought it was much, much more interesting. So what I did was I combined business computer sales with bespoke software development for companies. And that led me to running my first software company. That was when I was 21. Wow. And I made every single mistake in the book running a software company at 21. Uh, it was great because it taught me everything not to do in future. <laughs> right. um, the only decent thing I did at that time was uh, we, we closed a deal with uh, Citibank, which paid for the wages for the entire year for everybody. So, you know, that was a, that was a good deal. Uh, but other than that, the rest of it wasn't terrible mess and uh, I got out of that and went into IT management for a big book publishing company in the UK um, they were called Hodder and Stoughton and now called Hodder Headline um, so I was IT manager there for a few years and that gave me a really good understanding of what it meant to sit on that side of the desk and be pitched to all the time by salespeople but I missed sales I missed marketing that was much more dynamic much more interesting so I got back into it and ended up um, running software companies um, with much more success than the first one. Uh, that's what got me into sales and marketing and software and technology. And uh, I just made a living out of doing that on a regular basis. So I was effectively in startups all the time, one after the other after the other. We just didn't call them startups back then. You know, sure. it, was just, it was just doing business. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you feel the need to kind of hop around? Because you have been on both sides of the desk, you know, receiving pitches, throwing pitches, but also being creative, those kind of things. Do you have a need to hop around still even to this day, you think? No, I mean, I've always stayed in one place for a reasonable amount of time. You know, you, you won't find me sort of bouncing around from position to position because I think that, you know, once you get into uh, one particular spot, you have to see it out and you've got to really put everything into it if you're constantly moving about from place to place, and it's it's really important to me from an employee retention perspective as well to make sure we retain people and, and keep them, and you know try and try and get past the you know can they do this? Uh, you know if if they can, then give them all the tools they need. If they can't do it or won't do it, that's two very different problems. If they can't do it, you can train them and then retain them. If they won't do it, then that's when you have to say goodbye. But you want to try and retain people and you want to try and stay in a place of retention yourself because it costs so much to bring everybody up to speed and it takes so long to bring new people up to speed that if you're constantly having everybody on revolving doors, it just costs the, the company so much money that eventually it, it hurts. And so I've always tried to stay in a place for, for a reasonable amount of time to see everything out to its ultimate conclusion. Um, and it's worked out well for me in that respect, but also try to make sure that we train people and make them better and give them new skills so that they want to stay with the company. And uh, the old adage is, is very simple. You know, people say to me, well, that old thing of what if you train them and they leave? Mm -hmm. You spend all that money on right. that. Uh, but the opposite to that is what if you don't and they stay, they stay. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. And that's the problem because then you end up with fairly, you know, I, Nobody's mediocre. Everybody is, is great. They're all trying to get where they want to be. But everyone can always get better. They can always learn how to do things better. They can always learn new skills. They can always help you get to the end goal. And uh, if you don't invest in, in training them and pushing them forward, then everyone stays on the even keel. And that's no way to create growth in an organization. That's great. Do you, so do you have any other tips for potentially startup founders since you have so much experience being an entrepreneur and managing companies? Yeah, work out how to make a profit. Uh, <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> um, you know, back in the day, we used to sit and actually work out how to, much to sell something for based mm -hmm. on how much our cost base is and work well, out how to make a profit What if you just have a lot of users? <laughs> uh, you know, I, there, are, there are lots of ways to run a business. But, um, you know, even if you're in an inorganic phase because you're going after funding and that allows you to be inorganic and grow 
quickly. Um, and we know from the data that we have that when it comes to things like mobile marketing, the vast majority of mobile marketing is going to user acquisition. It's not going to customer service and retention and advocacy, uh, which is an issue because if you're constantly just buying everyone in, buying everyone in, um, if you don't have an amazing onboarding experience, if you don't have great customer service, those people are not going to stay with you. So you're actually buying very expensive users. And whilst it, it's great for the ego to see all those numbers coming in and saying, oh, we've got to, you know, 10,000 users in no time at all. The problem is, is next month you end up with 5,000 users because 5,000 uninstalled or left or stopped their subscription. So it's it's important to still, even if, if you're in an inorganic phase, to still have an eye on how you're going to generate a profit, but also how you're going to retain those people. It comes back to retention again. It's a nice theme. But retention works for customers just as much as it does for employees. Um, you get that retention from great experience, great onboarding, good customer service. And then you build your raving fans. So you might have 10,000 users, maybe a 1,000 of them, or even maybe a 100 of them are raving fans. And those are the ones that go off and find 10 people each to come into your service and automatically become raving fans almost because have been recommended by their friends, which is much more powerful than seeing an advert or getting a, an in-app message to you know, get the next app or you know whatever you're doing to bring people in. Um, it's much more effective if people are spreading that through word of mouth and referral and advocacy. Absolutely. If they love what you do, they want to talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. How do you find raving fans? How do you find them? Well, there's lots of different ways. You know, you can through paid user acquisition, really target and segment, make sure that you really, really understand exactly who is likely to want your solution, your product or service, and really nail that down, really target them specifically with the right message. And then you can acquire really high quality users that way. And then if you treat them well afterwards, they will become raving fans. That's one way. The other way is, you know, through um, organic mechanisms. So if you've got an app, for example, we know that organic acquisition is going to account for somewhere between 70 and 90% of all of your installs. So, you know, paid acquisition is important and, and it's something that you need to do, especially in the early stages, but you mustn't understate how important organic acquisition is for you. And the way that you get organic acquisition is having a really great story to tell and tell it in a unique way and make sure that that is telling people what your product or service actually does for them, not all the bells and whistles that it's got, right? People don't buy features, they buy benefits. Uh, people still make purchasing decisions based on emotion, not just based on, you know, needs. You know, they, they want to buy something because they, they want it, not necessarily because they need it. It's still an emotional decision. So you've got to give them a reason to do that. Storytelling is a great way to do that. So, you know, we talk a lot in marketing terms about things like content marketing being king and content being king and queen. Um, you know, I think that's really important, but you've also got to be unique and different. You can't just be the company that's doing a blog post on your corporate blog saying, you know, five ways to use Snapchat for your business, because I can read that story 10 times a day on, you know, any website in the world. And, and also, Google doesn't care about your content if all you're doing is Me Too content. If you're doing the same thing that's already been done a thousand times, it's not going to show up in the results on Google. But if you come with something that's original, fresh, interesting, that tells a story, that explains to people why they should care about you, and deliver that in a unique way, then you can win. Yep, yeah, definitely. You are based in England. I am. Do you also cover startups out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I cover anything that is to do with how we uh, use mobile-first, mobile-only technology to uh, get in front of people to sell and market uh, products and services to people right now. Right. So if it's if it's mobile-first, mobile-only marketing technology, I care about it. If it's to do with mobile engagement, I care about it. Um, we do cover a lot of American companies because, you know, we're here in San Francisco. Um, but, yeah, I make a point of looking around that what else is, is out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we cover startup ecosystems all across the world at, at VentureBeat. And, uh, you know, I make a specific 
uh, beeline for uh, some of the great London-based companies and uh, UK-based companies that are doing really smart, clever things. Because of course, I'm, I'm in that neck of the woods. So. Right. And how do you find the two different, uh, the two ecosystems different? How are they unique? They're they're actually you know not that far apart from each other. Um, they, when you look at different countries, you realize that there are equivalent pockets of people just doing really smart things everywhere. Um, Silicon Valley is you know, really interesting and uh, there's a lot of super smart stuff here but then you've got in the UK the Silicon Roundabout community, we call it in Berlin you've got Silicon Alley you go every single place and there is one city where you'll find a really great ecosystem, you know, in Scandinavia um, several startup ecosystems around Helsinki and Oslo, they're doing amazing stuff in Reykjavik, in Iceland a lot of companies out of Finland as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, and Tel Aviv in Israel is, is a hot spot. There's right. a, a lot going on there. And, you know, I know there's a there's a tendency for the Silicon Valleyites to compare themselves in terms of unicorn exits with everyone else. And they'll go, well, Tel Aviv, that's great, but there's only ever been one unicorn leave Tel Aviv. That's not really how we should be measuring people, right? Because those valuations are bunk anyway. What we really should be looking at is, you know, job creation, how good are these solutions are actually you know, helping people and uh, the products and services? What do they do for people at the end of the day? And everyone's got some great ideas. There's lots of uh, jobs being created. You know, look at VR, for example. Mm. You know, we know of on our on our landscape for VR, we know of over 299 companies right now that are driving the VR story forward. They're employing over 40,000 people right now. They're valued at $13 billion right now. Wow. And that's before we even really get started because the, the products that matter uh, that are going to drive VR forward, um, you know, some of them are starting to trickle out now. They don't really hit until November this year. Mm -hmm. So it's really a 2017 proposition. But you've still got 40,000 people employed by that industry to take a big swing at it. Right. And that's exciting. And that's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. And Facebook just came out with a new product or feature, a 360-degree camera, I believe. Yeah, you've got 360-degree uh, cameras, um, you know, consumer cameras, so that people can live stream in 360 degrees and then and also record that in 360 degrees and then share that with people on Facebook and on YouTube. You've then got the ability to do that very cheaply. You can use your mobile phone with Google Cardboard to put it on and move your head around and see everything in, in three dimensions that way. You can go and upgrade up from that and get one of the, uh, you know, slightly more robust units like the Samsung and the LG. And coming soon, in fact, at Google I.O., they just announced a brand new plastic, you know, cardboard unit, effectively. Looks just like a Samsung Gear VR. You're not going to, you know, be able to design something that looks too much different than uh, pretty much every other headset that's out there because they've all, they all got the same feature. Uh, but it works with a lot of different phones, and that'll get you into it. And then the next tier up from that is the Sony PlayStation VR, the HTC Vive, those kinds of units that are coming up, which will really push everything forward, along with Facebook's Oculus. Those are the top tier of solutions as they stand. Those are really, really going to be interesting towards the end of the year. The data we have suggests that we're talking about millions upon millions of units being shipped in 2016 alone. Wow. And next year it starts to really become a mainstream proposition to be playing virtual reality video games and having completely immersive movie and entertainment experiences and virtual travel experiences all within a VR environment. That's going to be crazy. <laughs> that is gonna be, I'm going to need a lot of bandages because I'm going to have that thing on my face and just be running into stuff all the time playing Pac-Man you know, in like my virtual world. And uh, so I'm going to invest in some Johnson & Johnson just because I know everybody's going to need to wrap things up and protect them. You should do that. Um, in fact, you, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, right now we should probably buy shares in Band Aid or something. Like sure. That. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or, or there's some kind of nausea relief. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you about the nausea problem actually, because uh, a lot of people are ill when they try VR. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, to do with the head tracking mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're when you're using VR and you move your head to the right, if the image doesn't move exactly at the right time then you start to get that sort of car sickness feeling. Yeah. And there's been some really exciting stuff happen with, uh, you know, some of, some of our people and other journalists who have tried out some of these VR systems when maybe they weren't quite ready. 
especially when you combine them with things like, you know, VR on your head whilst you're cycling, for example. Yeah. Oh or my VR gosh. on your head whilst you're on a roller coaster, for example. Right. I did a VR roller coaster, but not. While on a roller coaster, that well, sounds it's VR crazy. While on a roller coaster, yeah, they have that yeah. uh, no, 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 Six no. Flags Magic Mountain, and <laughs> right. you can go on there. And I, I don't know how you don't destroy the VR headset because I mean everything <laughs> falls out of your pockets anyhow. And now right. you have this thing on your face. And then, oh like, a, a, I tried to do Periscope while on a roller coaster oh down at Magic Mountain. The Periscope is like, I don't know what you're trying to do. You're shaking me. I'm upside down. I'm sideways. I just quit. You're like, it just it overloaded. The uh those changes that are coming, and that's just the tip. Like they're going to get so much better, and different things you can use with that. The virtual reality thing is that's going to be something else. It really is. And it's it's kind of a it's kind of a gateway drug to what we, from an academic standpoint, call mixed reality. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of people call it augmented reality. It's it's really not augmented reality. Is where you point a camera at something specific, like a QR code. Mm-hmm. And then that QR code turns into a virtual object. So it means you're turning a physical object into something virtual. Mm -hmm. Mixed reality is where we're overlaying virtual objects on the real world and they're reacting to the real world without the need for that QR code, without the need for that special card or whatever or that uh, particular graphic device. And That's uh, uh, Magic Leap, right? Magic Leap and Mm -hmm. HoloLens from Mm -hmm. Microsoft and there's lots and lots of those coming. They're a few years away from being a real consumer unit because in order for that to work beautifully and properly and, you know, the, the way that they're showing you they'd like them to work right now, they need to be wireless or at least, you know, plugged into your smartphone and, and using the, the data plan on your smartphone to provide the, the content, right? They need to be, have a wide field of view. They need to be nice and comfortable and sit on your face for the whole day because you know, potentially what you're going to do is you're going to sit and you're going to throw a screen up on the wall and then that screen's going to track you as you move around the office or maybe, you know, as you walk down the road and <laughs> you'll be at your desk working on your, your computer and you'll look to your left and there's your weather widget you've thrown down that looks really beautiful and awesome but you just might want to swipe it away and all that kind of stuff. And to get there, that's that's years away. VR is like the, the gateway drug to that experience. Mm. Mm-hmm. But VR's beachhead really is going to be the video game industry because... Right now, VR works as a cabled solution connected to some sort of device, whether it's a $1,500 PC or a you know $300 PlayStation 4 or whatever it is. And because it's that, it's very similar to the video game experience where you're sitting in your living room with your controller in your hand playing on the TV. And uh, so that's naturally going to be where everybody starts getting into VR. The more interesting applications of VR are in like the health tech industry. Mm-hmm. And in education and in, in those kinds of spaces. But they are not going to get the number of users needed to push the entire industry forward. So that's why everyone's focused right now on video games and on the entertainment industry and on immersive movies. Because that's where you can drag in millions of consumers into the experience and really take the whole industry forward. This could be awesome where music is going. Yeah. Where you could put on a concert that has 10 million people at it. You know, because you will sit there in your in your virtual space, and, and there's Prince. I mean, literally, it could be Prince. It could be yeah. Prince, right? We could bring him back. Yeah, I think we should. Prince, oh man, I, <laughs> yeah, it could be. And and yeah. and in you know, in the video game industry, of course, you've got the esports movement, sure. which, although it's not really well known in general consumer terms yet, um, it will be. You know, people like ESPN have done deals to start uh, broadcasting esports, so right. it's going to become more mainstream. Instead of you just being at the arena watching people play the game, or instead of you being home watching a stream of people in the arena watching people play the game, Mm. how about if you put a headset on and you're now in In the the game game. watching your favorite esports player play it from inside the actual game itself and looking around and seeing what they're doing and following them and maybe having like flying cameras. So you could be a drone inside the esports game watching that. And that could be a subscription model that you have to pay for in order to get access sure. to. Well, you could have a subscription model where you cut your hand up and you're yelling at Lionel Messi, hey, hey I'm open, I'm open, <laughs> send it this, you know, and and really take it to, I mean, because how, how great is that for that individual athlete to have this, you know, they build their own app, their own game. This is, you know, you're going to play soccer with me and my bros, you know. Yeah. That would be fun. That would be yeah. insane. And, and taking it out of entertainment, you know, just think about it from a business point of view. If you're one of those companies that, 
employs people all around the world and you're, you know, you work with uh, telepresence and you're doing maybe Google Hangouts or Skype or whatever, or you've got, uh, you know, Slack and you're messaging each other and you're doing voice messages and all that kind of stuff all through there. You know, imagine instead that uh, everybody pops a, a headset on and you're all sat in a virtual room with each other and actually interacting with each other in that virtual space, right? So you're having a real meeting sat there with everyone. It's like leagues beyond the, uh, you know, video conferencing or audio conferencing facilities we have right now. Sure. And, and we're not talking sort of, you know, ridiculous future here. We're talking about like next year. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's that- crazy. Still, though, the, the mix of virtual reality and reality still is real, though. And there are, you know, inner ear problems you have to sort out. Like, I, we did, uh, we did, so I, I used to be a military type guy. I'd been over to Iraq and Afghanistan a lot. And we did pre-deployment training where you looked at a really lame video game version of driving around. And so you're in a Humvee and you got a gunner and he's got, you know, and you're in this little room. You're not moving an inch, but you're driving around and you're driving over people and cows and messing around. But almost universally, everybody gets some form of car sickness. And you open the door and you put your foot on the ground and go, oh, yeah, that's right. There's still an earth here. I'm really not moving. Right. And you get back to it. But that's a crappy, like, early 90s graphics video game. When when you really mix it in, even if you can see the world that you're interacting with, marble is still marble. And it hurts when it hits you in the face. How do we deal with inner ear problems and those kinds of Any idea at all? Well, a lot of the top tier solutions have got the head tracking sorted out so that when you move, um, the, the movement of the virtual space is, mm-hmm. is identical and therefore that avoids that mm-hmm. car sickness issue. Right. There is still an issue, of course, with haptic feedback in virtual reality. Right? If you're actually grabbing hold of something, how do you make it feel like you're grabbing hold of something? Sure. And there are solutions to that. Um, with PlayStation VR, they've got the move controllers. Mm-hmm. And that's a new lease of life for Move because, you know, they launched Move, they sold millions of, of Move units, and then they didn't really support it. Sony didn't support it really with products and software to keep it going. It's now giving Move a new lease of life because those Move controllers now become the bow or the frisbee or, you know, whatever. Sure. You've got something in your hand, you're, you're pushing a button to, to interact with it. So you're getting something there, it can't, some kind of haptic feedback in terms of... Right. You know, I think, this, I, think I saw actually some gloves that are either coming to market very That's soon it. or already in market that actually you can feel the weight, you can feel coldness or warmth. Uh, and so I think we're actually pretty close to... Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the, the next level the from there. I mean, yeah. having these controllers like the ones on the HTC, you know, they're all well and good and they give you something to hold on to and, and, and you know, move around a control. But that's no different really to holding a, a standard VR game controller in your hand and doing the same thing there. The gloves you're talking about, you know, they're not that far away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, those will be really interesting. Um, I've seen an entire haptic feedback bodysuit that oh, you wow. can okay. put on. <laughs> and now there's a guy um, in Chatsworth, California who produces porn going, I gotta get up to Silicon Valley, get a look at this stuff. Right. I got some ideas. And that, and that's the thing, you know, I mean, we always joke in the technology industry that, uh, we know some, when something's going to become a success because the porn industry get involved and, right. and you right. know, jump on it. You know, Sony would like to think that Blu-ray is, you know, sure. basically here and the standard for high definition because they won against uh, HD DVD. Right. And the PlayStation 4 played a big part in that, but also it's because the porn industry decided they like Blu-ray better. Yeah. That's incredible. Fascinating. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> the future. So for a startup founder, someone that is looking to get a story perhaps placed in VentureBeat, what would be the best way for them to go about doing that? The first thing really is is have some real news, right? Mm-hmm. It's when uh, VentureBeat and many other publications, that they're not going to be really interested in a growth story. You know, if you come to us and say we've grown 100%, that sounds really great to you. To us, we'll be going, well, yeah, of course you have. It's your first year. If you didn't grow 100%, <laughs> it means you didn't sell a single thing. You know, I only have to sell something for a dollar and I've grown 100% in my first year. If you're coming to us and saying we've won this award, if you're coming to us and saying that, for, you know, let's just be brutally honest. If you're writing your press release and at the same time as writing it, you're virtually patting yourself on the back, you probably shouldn't send that to any tech news publication. So have some real news like a product launch. Have some real news like 
a funding announcement mm-hmm. and get in touch with the journalist that absolutely covers your thing by doing your research. Right. I should probably start a Tumblr of all of the off-topic pitches I get. And the fact is, is you only have to spend about two and a half minutes Googling my name right. and clicking and reading about maybe one or two paragraphs to see what I write about. Mm-hmm. Because I do make it ridiculously obvious what I write about. And yet I'll still get pitches for beauty products. The other day I got one for a, a ball, a robot ball that rolls around the floor picking up dust. It's <laughs> great. So, you know, it sounds I get, like something I need though. Yeah. yeah well, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll put you in touch. That's fine. So have hard news like a product announcement or a funding announcement or have some really unique data. A lot of technology companies, especially in, in Silicon Valley, you know, their SaaS products, their subscription models, they've managed to get their first 10,000 customers. What that means is they're probably processing a million, two million, or maybe a billion or a trillion pieces of data through their platform every day. Mm-hmm. Can they tell a story with that data that's never been told before? Mm-hmm. And then pitch it to the right journalist. Do your research. Tell them why they should care about it. You know, sometimes they will care. Sometimes they won't care. But that's the, that's the game you play. It's like selling something. Sometimes people will buy it from you and sometimes they won't. But you've got to put that effort in. Um, don't just, you know, go and look on Reddit and see that somebody's offering up a list of a thousand journalists and pitch them all with your thing that nobody cares about. You know, the fact that you opened up your Twitter account or something like that. Nobody cares. So don't take the self-congratulatory stuff. Take the really hard news. Nail it down to the maybe two or three journalists that actually write about your particular product or service. Build a relationship with them and do the work. Mm-hmm. Then you'll get the results. And that's that's how really to do it. Um, all of these databases that are available and all these solutions that are available that just pitch your thing to every journalist, there's no good in that. Yeah. Um, because you just won't get any success. Mm-hmm. Definitely customize the story, the pitch to the journalist. Do you think that press releases are dead? or No, press releases are great. I use press releases for background. I never actually uh, use the content of the press release in the story, but they're really important to me to have that press release for background. That press release allows me to write intelligent questions or and, and send them via email or get on the phone and ask the, the CEO or founder or CTO those intelligent questions because I had that press release, mm-hmm. because I had that background. Right. But I'm not going to write a story that includes any of the words in the press release mm-hmm. um, simply because Google will look at it and think, well, all that he's done is copy the press release. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to be great from a, from a Google perspective. Um, if I'm telling the story from my perspective in terms of what I think this is, what I think it does, why I think it's important, why I think they might have some challenges, and I'm putting in absolutely unique quotes from somebody at the company. First of all, I'm going to write a better story. Second of all, Google's going to compare, care more about it than they would you know, if it was just a press release. Uh, but it does all flow from that PR piece in the first place. Otherwise, I don't have the background. Okay, great advice. You've seen how far we've come. How far up the curve are we? Is it still going straight up? Are we still changing constantly? Is, it, is there an end in sight to that? It's a, it's a really interesting question. What I've noticed is that you get these things come in waves, always, always in waves. Look at mobile, look at apps. Right now, every single day, 2,300 apps are launched across the two major app stores. 2,300. Um, a huge percentage of those are never found by anybody, never installed, not even used once. But what you're looking at there is really just something that has become a regular marketplace. It didn't used to be a regular marketplace. It was an absolute land grab. But what it's become now is 95% of the apps that are released fail and 5% succeed. And that's been the same for every single technological release and achievement, which is why so many people, you know, think that, that uh, first release advantage is, is important. If you're first in a space, it's, it gives you a real impetus. It'll be the same in VR. You know, right now, there's a big plan grab. Everyone's trying to get their piece of the pie. Eventually, there'll be so many things that are released within the VR space and the uh, mixed reality space, but it will turn into a normal marketplace where 5% are the winners and 95% lose. And then it will be the next thing after that. <laughs> and, you know, we're constantly doing this. In, in the world of marketing technology, we still haven't even crossed the chasm. And the reason we still haven't crossed the chasm and actually moved into 
the world of, of general acceptance is because we don't do marketing with one tool. We do marketing with 20, sometimes up to 100 different tools knitted together in an ecosystem every month. Uh, some of those are free, some of those are paid for. And in order for us to cross the chasm, all of those tools have to cross at the same time. You can't just have one leap over and leave all the others behind. So we're still in a world where marketing technology is, is only used by less than 10% of all of the companies. Mm-hmm. It's only the, the people with the real money that have, that have got that. Eventually, you'll get market saturation, 5% will win, 95% will lose. So it's just going to keep going in cycles. It'll be the same with electric cars. It'll be the same eventually with hydrogen cars. It'll be the same with flying cars. <laughs> you know, Whatever we end up with, it's just going to go through the same cycle again and again. So, Stuart, there's been a lot of evolution in technology, and more and more we're becoming more dependent on that technology. Do you think that that actually makes us smarter, or is that making us more dependent on the technology so we're not thinking as much. We, we have a lot of research that suggests that we're becoming worse thinkers because we're relying on technology to think for us. And as we move forward into artificial intelligence, the oncoming swirl of chatbots within messenger platforms, which will become like the new app stores, you know, all of these things are going to think for us. So, you know, look at Google I.O. And they just launched Google Home, which will come out later this year to the point where it says to you, your normal route to work today is going to be 30 minutes more because there's traffic. And you say to it, thanks, Google Home. Could you contact Vanessa and say that I'm going to have to move my 7.30 to 8 o'clock? And could you change my dinner reservation for tonight to push that out an extra hour? And it will then do it for you. And all of that, dependence upon artificial intelligence and bots and uh, systems to basically interact with each other and, and do those things for you. Um, there's a lot of research that suggests that uh, that dependence on the technology is reducing our own ability to do those things, and therefore we're becoming uh, shallower thinkers. Whether that really pans out or not, we'll have to wait and see, because nobody's done the long-scale research over the period of 50 years to work out whether it's really true or not. If you look at the way that children play, even through the years of all the video games coming out and everyone being really scared that video games are going to just cause this huge influx of kids that don't want to move from the sofa, it turns out that they actually miss human interaction and going out and kicking a ball. And they gave up on the video games and started getting out and enjoying themselves again. So We'll have to wait and see how these things pan out because the research says one thing. There are trends that say that actually people need those kind of interactions. We'll have to wait and see if it uh, changes the way we think or not because the, the long scale research hasn't been, hasn't been done a lot. Yeah, I think that's why an investment in creativity is so important because there's going to be a lot of tasks that you can automate. You've got your calculator on your phone, so you don't necessarily need to learn math, but art, music, the finer things, they stimulate the brain in new ways and, and create those neural passageways that are so important for us. Yeah, all the things that uh, they've been defunding uh, in education <laughs> yeah. systems across the United States. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Gardner, you know, and all his different intelligences, he has one of them spatial. And so the person that can walk you down a river and get you back out alive is going to be worth a lot more money because you're not going to have the first clue of how to do that anymore if you haven't worked on those spatial. And a guy like Prince is going to make a ton of money because – then what else is he going to be able to do what he does? Right. Just sit you down and pull those emotions out of you. There's mm-hmm. not a bot that does that. Right. Not exactly. like Prince does. No, exactly. We could probably wrap it up soon. It's getting close to six. Yeah, and I've got to six. Sh- shoot off very soon. Okay, so my last question for you is, what's your favorite internet acronym and what does it stand for? My favorite internet acronym. Can I go back to a pre-internet acronym? Sure. So when I used to work alongside Hewlett Packard, I was party to one of the meetings uh, with which they, they name products. Uh, and usually it's a process that involves several bottles of wine and people who are paid an awful lot of money. And eventually they come out with something. And Hewlett Packard were great at coming up with acronyms for products that internally meant something else than externally. Um, they had like jokey internal names, but they meant something else externally. And they spend quite a lot of time crafting these. 
And my favorite was always the scanning protocol Twain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which actually stands for toolkit without an important name. <laughs> yeah. Tool Twain is awesome. Toolkit without an important name. <laughs> yeah. And you could always tell the difference between an American acronym and a British acronym, mm -hmm. I might say, because basic was beginners, all purpose symbolic instruction code. The first programming language in Britain was PL1, programming language one. <laughs> We're much more basic than basic. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Stuart. It's been great talking to you, and thank yeah. you for being our inaugural guest on Popping the Bubble. Uh, thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll, we'll have to do the return journey and uh, have you on VB Engage. Which oh, is, my goodness. That'd be wonderful. That would be yeah, good. Eventually. Make sure you hit us with your uh, social media stuff so everybody can know where to find you, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm fairly easy to find as long as you spell my name right. It's uh, Stuart. S-T-E-W-A-R-T -E and Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S. Uh, but you'll also find me as the real SJR on pretty much every platform. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Man, the inaugural show. Yeah.